teaching on humility again this morning. <laughs> well, I keep telling you we're through. I know we're through now, and we're not yet. Well, we knew we weren't quite through the other evening. We had two teachings, like I told you, and we've just two on humility and really developed it into to many. So we're going to kind of pick up just this message will go right uh, the tail end of the earlier one, right where we were earlier. What we were ending up with, we were looking at a threefold expression of humility via modesty, modesty of appearance, modesty of pursuit, modesty of conduct. I don't think we actually got around to reading, if you look in Colossians 2, we never really got around to reading these verses because I was running a little short on time. We said that there are many false ideas about humility. Some people, for them, it's an, a pious inferiority complex. For some people, it's asceticism. That kind of seems to be what's going on here in Colossians 2, verses 18 and 23. Sometimes it's, um, you'll see it in a person, and this also seems to be part of the, the case that we have here. You'll see a person who has some type of knowledge about something trying to say that they really don't have that knowledge about that item, that's a false sense of humility then. It's dishonesty. It's basically dishonesty, but it's certainly a manifestation of what Colossians does refer to here as false humility. They'll just say, oh, no, that's really not true, when really it is true. And what we were ending with was a very important point as far as I'm concerned, and that is uh, the subject of, of thank yous, which you'll probably remember we were talking about. Uh, don't just pass off someone's thank you. Don't just pass off someone's compliment. That's a manifestation of a false sense and a false form of humility. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. And doesn't the NIV someone say false humility? Someone, no one has the NIV. Colossians 2. Well, I'm just assuming that it does. Some of the versions have 218, 218, and 223. Um, false humility. False humility in 218. Okay. What about in 23? Um, false humility. Okay. Mm -hmm. They give us almost a positive here, and it's ah humility. You know, you put an A in front of it, it negates what it is. It's not humility. It's false humility. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a false humility, voluntary, you know, they, I, I explained what that meant in a, two or three messages ago, I guess, and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment to, ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. And then verse 23, which things, well, we need the end of 22 after the commandments and doctrines of men, touch not, taste not, handle not, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship, voluntary worship, and false humility, and neglecting of the body, asceticism, and not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh, asceticism. That's false humility here. What are we talking about here in Colossians? We're talking about one of the chief, maybe we could say, well, I guess maybe second in line behind Judaism, one of the chief heresies of the first century, and that's Gnosticism. Colossians 2 is written to combat Gnosticism, which was in part controlled by, as we just have read here twice, a false humility. A false humility. People who just say, I'm no good, I can't do anything, and just badmouth themselves on and on and on, when that's really not what they think about themselves. I mean, in other words, they're not thinking that in the, in the sense of, oh, I am nothing compared to God. My wisdom is nothing in comparison to God. That's true. But they're really not thinking that way. They're just wanting to sound pious to someone. They're just wanting, if, if, uh, if you give them a thank you, they're wanting to sound, sound as though um, I'm so lowly, I'm so humble, I'm so meek, I don't even deserve a thank you from anyone. So they just pass that off, pass by that real quickly, and end up expressing false humility and end up doing damage to the person to whom they're speaking. 
because human relationships are built upon gratitude, though they're supposed to be. Let's say good human relationships are built upon giving and receiving, giving and receiving, which involves gratitude. You're grateful for the opportunity to give. You're grateful for the opportunity to receive as well. Oh, well, I guess in saying that, what comes to my mind, what would come to some people's mind is, well, Acts 20 says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so if I've received something, I just, it's just nothing at all, and I don't deserve it, and blah, 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 bad-mouthing themselves. That's uh, false humility. The person is immature. They don't have their spiritual or their natural head screwed on to their shoulders correctly. They're a person that's not fun to be around, not agreeable to you. And so we're just saying take a warning, take a lesson, learn a lesson from what Paul is talking about here in Colossians and other forms that I have expressed here are false ideas about humility. Nobody likes to be around that at all. Now, another thing that we could almost refer to as false humility, not really, but I'm going to put it here into this category, is what I call sudden spurts of humility. Now, sudden spurts of humility are not the Christian virtue of humility. What are they? They are just convictions over your lack of humility. And so you have a sudden spurt in that grace or that virtue. You know, you hear a message. You hear a whole series of messages like you are now on humility. And so you just really act humble now for the next couple of days until maybe next week or the next week. Then we could say it's true you're practicing humility. It's not false humility. But those are just su sudden spurts. They're, they're just temporary sudden spurts of humility that are not the true Christian virtue. Why? The true Christian virtue is a fruit that takes time to mature but that matures gradually and consistently, day after day after day after day. Hopefully you have more humility, you're more humble today than you were the same day last year and the same day the year before that. But let's hope it's not a spurt of humility after a message or a teaching on it and then back to arrogance and pride and then another spurt of humility and then after a while back to arrogance and pride. Why? What do we call those things? We call those, you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit of your lack of humility, and so you give forth a sudden spurt. But is that the fruit? No, the fruit of the Spirit is something that is mature, but that gradually is brought to maturity. And fruit that's going to be good fruit is brought to maturity consistently, not a sudden growth period and sudden stagnation and sudden growth and sudden stagnation, but it's continual, however gradual, consistent, growth that brings it to maturity. How important is humility? Shall I quote Augustine again? If you ask me what's the first precept of the Christian religion, I will answer you first, second, and third is the Christian virtue of humility. Calvin said it's important. Luther said it's aptness for greatness. Akempis said you have to have this to imitate Christ. That's what Philippians 2, Philippians 2, we're in Colossians 2, the book before this, Philippians 2 is all about imitating Christ and is imitating the humility of Christ talking about his incarnation there which the theologians in the past referred to as the great humiliation of Jesus Christ and what are we told let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus let this what how do we get humility by so thinking in our mind that's the chief way humble yourselves don't wait like Nebuchadnezzar for God to have to humble you the last verse of Daniel chapter 4 those who walk in pride was Nebuchadnezzar's conclusion God is able to abase. The last verse of Daniel chapter 4. Yes, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, to so think about yourself. This list of various uh, aspects of humility in what does humility consist. There are three areas where we manifest humility, or I could say three objects toward whom or toward which humility is to be manifested toward God, toward others, toward yourself. Remember, that's the threefold division here in ethics. God, yourself, and others. Let's start with the first one, humility toward God. Now, if we're going to talk about levels of humility, which I really uh, don't prefer, but humility and experience extreme sense in the Christian should be seen in his humble attitude toward God. 
It's good to be humble toward one another. We'll be to that here in a moment. It's good to think humble thoughts about yourself. Of course, humble thoughts about yourself tie in to your humility toward others and your humility toward God. But after all, I mean, let's face the facts. Expressing humility toward one another, you and that other person probably are on the same level. I mean, at least if you're on no other same level, you're on the same level of being part of humankind. You're a human. You're on the same level. Express your humility toward them. Well, that's not nearly as deep or as great as the expression of humility, the existence of humility in this area, and that is the area toward God. Why? Look at the distance that separates you from God. The distance that separates you from your Christian brother or sister, uh, be that great or small, whether he's higher or lower in comparison to you, is not that great of a distance not between you and any other Christian person. Be the greatest spiritual person and you the least of the spiritual people. The distance measured between you and that individual is not very great, not on the scale of the distance that separates you from God. I said that we just kind of rounded out the last teaching in saying this, think of God as a yardstick. If God's a yardstick, you hardly extend to the first millimeter, let alone the first inch or the first yard on the stick by which God and his greatness is measured. In relation to God, you see yourself as nothing more or nothing less than you. You're not an animal. You're a human in whom resides the image and likeness of God. You, you were created in his image. You're not an animal, but you're not above a human. You're not an angel. In relation to God, you see yourself as nothing more or nothing less than you. You have nothing, you are nothing apart from him. Remember Jesus said in John 15, 5, Apart from me ye can do nothing. John 15, 5, Apart from me, apart's a better translation than without. Apart from me, because the analogy there is the vine and the branches, so we're talking about being severed, not just, well, without, but being severed. Apart from me ye can do nothing. John, same gospel, chapter 3 and verse 27. John answered, A man can receive nothing except it were given him from above. You are nothing and you have nothing apart from your vital, sustained relationship with Jesus Christ. That says, of course, a lot about fallen humanity. You, as you were in former days, and fallen humanity out there in the world, that says a lot about, quote, great people, unquote. Great people outside of Christ are nothing and have nothing. Jesus said it in John 15, 7, apart from me, you can do nothing. And he doesn't just mean you can do nothing, you are nothing. What is a branch severed from the vine? It has nothing, it is nothing. It's dead. It's dead. He says it'll wither and men will gather them and throw them into the fire. We've given you the verses in the end of Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, where, among other things, Paul said, Who has first given to God, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? There's not a single individual debt that you owe God. That is something that, that you're going to give him because you feel obligated to do it. Any obligation, any compelling on our behalf comes because of what he first did for us. We're back over now to 1 John chapter 4. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us loved us how could you really repay him for a single 
drop of blood that was shed for your salvation. How could you ever repay him for that? Years of Christian consecration would mean nothing. Hours of studious work in God's word, which he commands. Study to show thyself. Exercise yourself to show yourself a man approved of God, one who knows how to rightly discern and divide the word of God. So you have to do something about studying the word of God to be able to divide it rightly or correctly. All of that, does all of that weighing it in the balance? Does it equal in weight? Put it on one of the old balance scales, all of your Christian consecration and your service to God and all of the works that you've done. Would that outweigh, would it balance uh, the weight, I'm speaking spiritually, I trust you realize, of a single drop of Jesus' blood? That single drop would cause the scales to hit the bottom so fast you'd think you never did any Christian work at all worth anything in God's eyes. That's how, that's how quickly it would hit bottom and that's how much the blood of Jesus would weigh a drop of it with regard to what we would have to offer him in return. That's why we looked in an earlier study several months ago now in the Old Testament, the things that God desires are the things really that only he can give to himself through us. And that, of course, would be all of these virtues. Micah chapter 6, does the Lord require ten thousands of rivers of oil or lambs, burnt offerings? You see, we could do that on our own. It says, no, God has shown you, O man, what he requires of your life to do justly. Could anyone really do, ever do that to love mercy? Could any of us really ever love mercy? We like revenge as a human. It's what we like is revenge. And to walk humbly with thy God, Micah 6 say. I said the only thing that he really requires of us is what he offers to himself through us. The fruit are referred to in Galatians 5 as the fruit of the Spirit. There's no way a human... A human being in his own power can bear the fruit of the Spirit. So what does God get from us? Nothing. He gets from us only what he himself has given to us. And that's the ability to produce these virtues. In other words, God wants us, let's say, to love, to love him, to love others. But who gave us the ability to love, though? God himself. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. You see, in other words, how unfair the whole relationship seems to be with regard to the Christian and his God. What does God get out of it? Nothing at all, except what he put into it. What do you get out of it? Everything that you didn't put into it. Seems like the whole relationship is unfair then. Well, it's fair. <laughs> it's fair. Let's don't complain about it. <laughs> Let, let's don't philosophize about it and say that's not fair now God's not getting a good end of the bargain because what can we do about it there's still nothing we could do about it I want you to see a passage over in 2 Samuel 7 verses 18 through 29 David was certainly one who knew how to express his humility toward God 2 Samuel 7 18 to 29 this is one of the passages we looked at earlier for postures of prayer because he goes in the only time and sits before the Lord. We said a sitting posture is like that of a little child. 2 Samuel 7, verses 18 through 29. Now you look at all of the things that he has to say here, how much God has promised him. It's God. He, the whole thing through this is, is David saying, I don't deserve any of this. He goes and sits before the Lord, which demonstrates his childlikeness, his childlike character, that what, what have I done to deserve all of these great promises God has given both to me and for the future for my descendants? I mean, uh, we're told right here in this chapter, the first 17 verses, remember, we have one of the greatest messianic promises in the Old Testament. It's called the Messianic Davidic Covenant here where the Messiah is promised through uh, David's loins. Of course, first of all, it has immediate reference to Solomon. He shall build me a house for my name, verse 13. But the ultimate reference is to Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 2, we are built up as lively stones into the temple of God. 
I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, Saul, uh, uh, Solomon died. So this couldn't have reference to him. Verse 15, my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. God's mercy never left the son. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. This is what the angel said to Mary. Thy throne shall be established forever. All of this promise to David and through David to his descendants, and the ultimate of those being Jesus Christ. Well, let's read the account here. Verse 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. Interesting posture there, and it's rare in Scripture. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? Humility in the first area expressed toward God. Who am I? Who is my father's house to have all of these kindnesses, these mercies, these tremendous promises that are given to us? I mean, try to put yourself in that place. You're not going to be the forefather of the Messiah like he was, but try to put yourself in his place where you have just been promised through you, just flesh and blood. He goes on to sin right here in this book later on, just flesh and blood. God himself, through his prophet, comes and speaks directly to him that through your seed will come the Messiah. What a, what a tremendous promise. What a privilege David would have to, to think the Messiah, the whole world, all of Christianity, we could say, has been birthed through the loins of King David. Amen. And what's he asking about all of this? Who am I, O Lord God? What is my father's house that you have brought me hither to? Do you think that about yourself and your relationship between you and God? Amen. Is that your understanding and comprehension of it? Are you just so incredibly grateful for what God has done. You have done nothing of it, nothing of it at all. None of it has been done by you. Any good that you have comes James 1.17 from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift. We have nothing at all. David recognized this over in Psalm 51, remember, that even in his sin, he had nothing to offer God except himself, himself with a contrite heart and a broken spirit. That's all he had to offer. He said, thou desirest not burnt offerings and sacrifices, else I would give them. What can he offer God? Nothing at all but himself for God to work through him. And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, just bringing me and my house this far. David, what was David? He was a shepherd boy. A shepherd boy that was exalted to the throne of the most important nation that's ever lived, the nation of Israel. And David, no doubt, the greatest king that Israel's ever had. So he's been brought to a lot, but he said, This is small because thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. How great? We just read it in verse 16. Forever thy throne shall be established. So he thought, what you've done for me is really small in comparison to what you promised through me to my descendants for the future. How long? He said, forever. Verse 20, and what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. I guess this is really special to me because I've experienced things like this when you, and I was yesterday, when you just sit before the Lord and what can you say? There's nothing to say. Amen. You don't have anything to say to him. But just sit there. He knows you. David says he's Psalm 139. Remember writing that. You know my thoughts. You beset me before and behind. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. God knows everything about us. David said, what can I say? How can I say thank you? That's what he's going to say here. He's grateful. He's trying to express his gratitude. But God already knows the depth or the lack thereof of one's gratitude. Of course, that doesn't mean don't express it. David went on to express it. David went on to say in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He went on to bless the Lord. But his comprehension of what he said was the following. These are mere words. Anyone could say them. Someone could say them and be insincere. Of course, God would know that. That's David's point here. These are just mere words that are being said here. Verse 21, for thy word's sake and according to thine own heart, 
Thou hast done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God. There is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. There's hardly a greater expression of personal humility that's directed in the area of God in all of Scripture than what you have here in 2 Samuel because of this great blessing that he has. I mean, we don't have that blessing. We've got a greater blessing than what David had. All that was true of David is that according to the flesh, Romans 1, verses 3 and 4, the Messiah would come. That's all that that meant for David. I mean, that's great, but nothing compared to what we have with the Holy Spirit living in us, with us being born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've got a greater promise, a greater blessing, a greater gift than David had. But how many times are people in the church less grateful than David for a greater blessing? There's the Amen. sad situation. Amen. They're less grateful for the greater blessing that they have received. Greater covenant, greater promises. The book of Hebrews says everything is better. We've got a better king than King David, a better priest than Moses, better blood than Abel's blood, better sanctuary than Solomon's temple. Everything is better. What one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself and to make him a name and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods? He says, what nation is like this nation? When God went to redeem a people unto himself. Well, isn't that even more true with us today? Amen. God just redeemed them physically. So many of the Israelites were unregenerate, remember, and died and perished and did not go to Abraham's bosom, as it were. They were unregenerate. God redeemed them physically in that he brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. But that does you no good at all if you die in your sins. Then you die in your sins with luxury and prosperity around you, which, of course, for Israel, sometimes caused the problems that she had. We read to you, I think, in the last teaching, Deuteronomy 8. That's the warning there, the teaching before. That's the warning. Remember the Lord your God. It's a warning not because they're in pride at that time, but a forewarning of the possibility of pride in the future whenever one's goods are increased. But how much, how much greater has been the, the personal search uh, that we're told, for instance, over in Luke chapter 15 of the one lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost prodigal son, where the father put everything aside and came looking for us, looking for us spiritually, looking for Israel spiritually, but basically physically, and then wants to give them the laws on Mount Sinai and wants them to obey him, which, of course, they choose not to do. But in Luke chapter 15, we've got those three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy. And the theme through it all is the father laid everything aside to come and seek after and to search for us. We read here in this verse, what one nation is like this nation that God went to redeem for a people to himself? You can say, what one person is like me, this person? That in all of my sin, I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't searching for God. Contrary to what some people think, I was looking for God, trying to find God. No, you really weren't. You were, you were following vain superstitions, false misconceptions about God. If you think you were following after God or searching for him or trying to find him, they were your own misconceptions about God. I mean, it was, it was something greater than yourself that you were looking for, but where did you look, Eastern religion? Then you're not looking for God. Where did you look? TM, Transcendental Meditation, Yoga, the pill generation, popping pills, trying to get a high and find God. Well, you're not looking for God. You're looking for your own misconception of the deity. And see, you didn't even, you didn't know God. You didn't even know the one that you thought you were looking for until the day that you met him in your salvation. And you find out, oh, this was not the one I was really looking for. I mean, in the sense, this is what I want. This is definitely what I want. But why didn't you open your Bible and find him earlier then? Your Bible was there all along. Some people get foxhole religion, but that's not true 
conversion. That's not true Christianity. You know, that's whenever the bombs are bursting overhead. You say, God, get me out of this place, and I'll serve you when I get home. Foxhole religion. Foxhole religion lasts about as long as you're in that foxhole, and the bombs are bursting overhead. It's foxhole religion. That's not true Christianity, not true conversion. Oh, what a knowledge, what a deep knowledge we have to have. And the only place you'll get it is from the Word of God and from meditating on God's Word and all the past benefits that he has wrought for you. Of the, the vast distance that separates us from God on the one hand and the closeness on the other in that we've been brought close to him, made nigh unto him. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, by the blood of Jesus Christ. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. There's not a lot David can do about it. He's just trusting that God will do the work. And is not that what we are supposed to do about our future life? Oh, I can hardly contain myself just with thoughts over what my future life must be like in, in, in looking at what my present life, how good it is. Amen. It's going to get gooder. Amen. It's going to get gooder. You already know that. You know how you were at one time in your life and how it gets better and better as you mature in the Lord. You can just hardly contain yourself with the thoughts of what the future holds for you. I told my wife again, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before. I've told you this story before. Maybe the day before that. I don't remember. But I said, we need an ox around here. We need an ox. We had some neighbors moved in, some Pentecostals, by the way, that moved in next door to us that had chickens. I can go wring a chicken's neck, cut its throat or something, and let the blood pour out before the Lord. You want to sacrifice some oxen to God. You're so, you want to do something, but there's nothing you can do, though. But just do like David. Just go sit down. Just sit there. God knows that you're there. God knows that you're there. He knows what's on your heart. I said, we wish we had an ox just to slay before God. That would must have been, I mean, think how Israel took all of that for granted in the Old Testament. We don't get that in the New Testament. And when I say we don't get it, I don't mean like, well, we're really missing out on something good. We have something better, better blood than the blood of bulls and goats. They took that for granted. If we were back under that covenant, because I think about it under this covenant. Think what a, a, a spiritual highlight that could be for your day or your week or your year. To lead old Bessie to the temple and have her throat cut and her blood poured out. I mean, because if you have any conception at all, and only a few of the Jews ever did, then you knew the life, uh, Leviticus chapter 17, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And when you offer the blood, the blood atones for the Hebrew is kippur. It covers one sin. It will cover your sin. See, for us, it's all, it's all spiritual, and it ends up kind of being mystical for some people. Where is the blood of Jesus? Well, that was 2,000 years ago. That was shed for us. For the Jews, it was day after day, week after week, week. A yearly reminder, we're told, in Hebrews chapter 10, which the author of Hebrews then uses to prove that it never could have perfected them or sanctified them forever or you would cease having the need for sacrifices being offered over and over again. But he said once a year, thinking of the Day of Atonement, a remembrance is made again of your sin. A remembrance is made again of your sin by the great Day of Atonement. I don't know that you could find, maybe you've never even heard that expressed before, this oxen business, but around here, I don't know you could find one Christian in 50,000, 100,000. I don't know what the percentage would be that's ever even had a thought like that. Every you having a thought, I've had that thought many times. I wish I had a bullet to slay before God. I'd like to watch his throat being cut and the blood poured out, and that would atone for my sin. That would show my gratitude toward God, cover my sin, and yet here's, you know, a chief part of my agricultural artillery here that I'm surrendering up to the Lord. So it's a great sacrifice. It's called a sacrifice, remember. It's a great sacrifice of of self-surrender via the vicarious experience through the animal that one is offering up to the Lord. And one Christian in a hundred thousand hasn't thought that, but rather they take everything for granted in their life. That's why they don't grow. They don't know what maybe some of us know. They're not experiencing the personal victory. They're always striving. Someone was sharing this morning about roller coaster people. 
Well, that's so true. Most people I have met in my Christian years have just been up and down, up and down, hot and cold, on and off, left and right. And as one brother said, either get right or get left is what the Word of God teaches. Get right or get left. Stop all of this up and down. Today's a good day, and then tomorrow's not a good day, and then today's a good day. It's back and forth, back and forth. They don't, they don't have personal victory in their life. I know they don't have as I have because I know my life and sometimes I know theirs via their mouth, by their confession or their eyes <laughs> or their face or their walk. There's no spring to their walk at all. Nothing but a negative confession is all they have to offer. Nothing but a negative confession. Nothing to offer positively at all. Nothing but a negative confession of, of their lack of victory that they have in their life. We talking about non-charismatics? No, charismatics. Who are supposed to have the blessed Holy Spirit. Nothing but a negative confession. Nothing but a defeated life. What do you have to show, you ask the charismatic Christian? What do you have to show for all the great work that God has done for you? Nothing but a negative confession and a slow, limping walk. Why? Christianity gets old to them. Am I talking to anyone here? Christianity gets old for them. Gets stale for them. Get stale. Am I talking to anyone with that word? It gets stale for them. There's not that continuous day by day by day, Psalm 16, fullness of joy, which only comes when, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. That only alerts the person to the fact they must not be there in the presence of God. Amen. See, David's in God's presence here. He's gone in to sit down before the Lord. There's fullness of joy fullness of experience there other people might not understand you they might mistake that for fanaticism maybe even a little bit of naivete why are they why are they always happy why are they always joyful well it's easy to be joyful and happy you see when you're in other people's company why you know that's the accepted standard at least in this church in charismatic circles in the Christian church out there, that's the accepted standard is you're supposed to be joyful. We talked about joy before. Act as though you have the victory, they say, even though we know, of course, we all know you really don't have it. None of us have it. I don't have it. You don't have it. But let's pretend like we do. It ought to be more than a pretense. It ought to be more than a pretense. The last two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is Paul going to say? Therefore, beloved brethren, be stable in your life. Be steadfast in your life. Don't shake back and forth. You read it, the last two verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Be steadfast and stable, not shaking, not wavering in your life. We know the reward that the Lord has laid up for us if we'll live a consistent Christian life. I do a lot of reflecting on all the past benefits. So a lot of people worry about their past mistakes. I don't. I, I'm grateful for the past mistakes because they bring present understanding and future blessings. A lot of people just worry and worry and wish they wouldn't have done this and wish that you would worry about your past mistakes. You know, they want to remind you of them. Well, let them remind me or you of them. It'll ex it'd be an area where you can express humility and say, yes, that's certainly true. They're wanting you to get sad about it, though. That's not any reason to get sad. That's the reason to be glad. What I, I say, past mistakes. Amen. Thank God they're past and not present. Amen. Or future, you're confessing you're going to fall 14 times tomorrow, this week or something. Past mistakes. If you have any spiritual sense to you at all, your past mistakes will be nothing but blessings for you now and in the future. They'll do nothing but ultimately result in your good. Romans 8, 28, I think, says something about that. They'll ultimately result in your good, regardless of what you have done, regardless of what has happened to you. I certainly think that way. And, and, just, and like I said, people want to remind you of your past mistakes. If you're not sad, and they are sad. They're sad about theirs. They want to bring you into their little party and make you sad about yours. Well, I'm not sad about mine. I'm rejoicing. I'm happy over them. I'm just glad for all that the work God has done in my life. Amen. I know there's a lot to be done in the future, and that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, verse 26, Let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. Let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. 
For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. For too many people, they don't live in, in, in reality, I guess I should say. They think that they're living in reality. They think that maybe someone like myself or you, if you're experiencing victory, that you're living in an unreal state. Maybe ideal, maybe ideal, but not unreal, though. They're not synonymous by any sense of the word. That is reality, though. That is true reality is living in the ideal Christian state of, of continuous full joy and of continuous Christian victory. Too many people don't live there. Too many live right on the fringes of that, right on the border. That's why we have what I talked about earlier, sudden spurts of humility. It can be sudden spurts mm -hmm. of anything. It just shows a person's living on the fringe there and they see what God requires of them they see what they would like to experience in their own life. Well, I would like to have some of that joy, some of that continuous victory in my life, regardless of the problems, regardless of what's going on, some of that continuous victory and, and boldness and peace and, and self-control and all of the other virtues at which we have looked and at which we will look. I see what I want to have, what God wants me to have, and I see what the world has to offer, and I don't want that. And so what do you do? You walk on the borders between Galilee and Samaria, right on the borders there. And you have sudden spurts over into Galilee, sudden spurts of humility. That's not true biblical humility. I mean, it's humility, but it's not true biblical humility because it's to gradually, consistently mature as fruit. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Now, have you ever found it in your heart to pray a prayer like this unto the Lord? So you can't go home this afternoon. You have to be walking in this type of victory. Well, that's just an expression of you. We should be like David in this area. We should be like David in this area where because of all that God has done for us and all that God has promised to us, then we find it in our heart to pray a prayer like this before the Lord. Are you grateful for what you have? What about those blessings called children that you have? Do you just sometimes just stretch out on the floor crying out, thank God for these blessings that I have? Or do you scream and yell and complain about them? You go in with your children when they're asleep at night and just stand there and just, you're overwhelmed. There's a child God has given you, not an animal, not a dog or a tree or a car or a library or a home or some clothes. I, I guess you would set a match to all of that before you'd surrender your, your least liked child that you have. <laughs> if there is a least liked one. I guess they're all most liked, but they're most liked because of certain characteristics only one has. And then this other one, only this one has. And this other one, only this one has. They're all different. I was just watching Irish yesterday, and I just, thank God. People complain, abort their children. <laughs> How could you abort? Well, you can as a Christian. You've really got a problem mentally if you can as on this side of the cross, go through something like that. But those who don't do that, uh, boredom in practice, I mean, in their experience of their child in growing up, this child, if this child would not have come into my life, or these children would not have come into my life, then I could have, and you fill the sentence out with 15 or less words, what you could have done. <laughs> you could have had a miserable life. You could have had a very unfulfilled life without children. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. Well, we would say thy words are true. <laughs> thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. What do you think your future holds for you? Goodness. That's what you're supposed to say. I mean, are you? I know Free, Dr. Freeman said men should not use the term excited. He said that's a feminine term, but uh, I'm going to use it anyway. That kind of sounds like Greek philosophy there. Anything that sounds womanish, you know, like humility or meekness. Freeman taught that on his tapes. He said you can ne a man can never use the term excited or thrilled because that's a feminine term. That's what a woman should say. I mean, how can a man say that thrilled me? 
well, if your wrists are cocked in a certain fashion, maybe you, maybe there is something wrong with the individual. <laughs> but I, I found it a little humorous that at the end of that message, he said, oh, I'm really excited about learning the Word of God. And I thought, well, <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I just came to my mind because that was, I heard that a few weeks ago, I think. I was going to ask you the question, though, are you excited about your future? Amen. What your future holds? Do you know that there is just goodness and greatness that doesn't compare to what you are having or experiencing right now? A lot of people don't know that. They don't think about that at all. They don't just live on the edge of expectancy in their life. Say, well, you've got something with X, X, X number of things to look forward to, and I don't have anything. Well, you must not have any promises from God to you then. For the continuation of 